Our next speaker is Renata Kalosh, who will talk about maximal supersymmetry and applications in cosmology. Um, I'll talk about maximal supersymmetry and application to cosmology. And there are people in this room who know about maximal supersymmetry much more than I do. I mean Lars Brink, Mark Hino. And there are people who know about cosmology also much more than I do. And I mean Slava Mohanov and Misha Shapushnikov and John Ellis. But what I'm trying to tell you, there is a relation between those two things, which fortunately is falsifiable by the uh, cosmological observations. And I was asked to give a talk in a very general form, so I'll try to do that. And you see my collaborators uh, are Sergio Ferrara, Dan Friedman, Diederik Ross, Tim Raze, Antoine Van Proen, Yusuke Yamada, and there is also work in progress with Herman Nicolay, Radu Royban, and Yusuke Yamada. So I'll try to, to tell you more about it, and let's see what will happen. So this is a short abstract which I posted, which says that we'll discuss fundamental theories with maximal supersymmetry. By this we mean uh, M theory, which is well known like in a low energy, it is 11 dimensional theory, super string theory, which is a 10 dimensional theory at the low energy. And also we can use maximally extended supergravity, which in four dimensions is just N equals eight supergravity. And some of these symmetries play an important role in improved uh, UV behavior of extended supergravity, which we learned more or less starting from 2009. And so uh, what I plan to explain is that, of course, if we take theories with maximal supersymmetry and spontaneously broken them down to minimal supersymmetry, we can deduce phenological models which are interesting for observational cosmology. And those models, which are known as alpha attractor models, which I hope to explain, they are in good agreement with uh, cosmic microwave background as well as large-scale structure observations. And they provide targets for future satellite missions designed for detection of primordial gravitational waves. So this is the purpose of my talk, and uh, let's see what I can succeed. So I'll have a long introduction which has the purpose of putting the scene for those two kind of very different parts of my talk, the formal and the cosmological. And so I'll proceed with introduction. And this is a picture which many of you may have seen uh, by, George, uh, by Gerhard Tuft, which tells us that LHC is probing energies uh, more or less below 10 to the 3 uh, GeV. And then he used to say, this is this long desert, and we know nothing all the way to Planck. And so what we can add to this picture, which is the main purpose of my talk, is to tell you why there are now so many experiments and so much effort for detection of primordial B modes, because they will come, if they will be detected, they will be approximately here if uh, they will be detected during the next 10 to 20 years. So if this famous number R is the ratio of scalar, sorry, tensor to scalar perturbation, which is now known to be below 007. We actually don't know if uh, primordial gravitational waves will be detected soon or in the next 20 years. This is totally unknown. <coughs> However, uh, the Hawking temperature associated with those waves is approximately 10 to the 13 GV. And this is the most significant thing which is known. So the energy scale of inflation, if gravitational wave will be detected close to 10 to the minus two, uh, is often compared with the energy scale of grand unified theories simply because you take uh, one quarter of the energy. But it is better way to understand the scale of 
inflationary perturbation by looking at the Hubble parameter, which is close to 10 to the 13 GV. So if primordial gravitational wave will be detected at about 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3, the Hubble parameter, we will know about it in most general models. And it will be 10 to the 13 GV. So what does it mean? We'll probe energy which are a billion times higher than the energies already probed at LHC. And what we all know, it is extremely difficult experiment with foregrounds and systematics. On the other hand, as of now, there is a huge competition between different people trying to get to this place. So um, let me tell you in which way I try, will try to describe uh, what we know from fundamental theory, what we learn from the sky, and the feedback. So the simple fundamental idea which follows from after discovery of general relativity is for many people <coughs> associated <coughs> excuse me, with local supersymmetry. And one of the reasons was that Einstein, for many years in his life at the end, was working trying to make a unified electromagnetism and gravity. And it was realized when extended N equals 2 supergravity was discovered in the 70s. And the model just adds two real gravitina to the photon and graviton. And already at that time, in early in 70s, it was discovered that the explicit calculation of photon-photon scattering, which is known to be divergent in coupled Maxwell-Einstein system, yield a dramatic result. The new diagram uh, cancel UV divergences. And this was in 76. And much more happened starting with 2009. So for higher end, there is more cancellation, which will be a significant part of my formal talk. So as we have heard yesterday, and as we of course know, that LHC did not discover low energy N equals 1 supersymmetry yet, nor gave us any evidence of extra dimensions so far. And many people think this is probably what will happen. We don't know for sure, right? Different people have slightly uh, different expectations. But therefore, I'm saying yet. Um, However, the plan of what I will tell you, if, however, you start with maximal supersymmetry, spontaneously broken to minimal one, you can test this in cosmology. So those three type of uh, fundamental theories include n equals 8 in d equals 4 supergravity, m theory, which is n equals 1 in d equals 11, and superstring theory, which is n equals 2 in d equals 10. So I'll talk about B mode targets and associated hidden symmetries. So the short summary of the theoretical part of the talk is about recent progress in n greater or equal than 5 supergravities in d equals 4. So number one is that it is now known that n equals 8 supergravity and n equals 5 supergravity are UV finite at loops at the order 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this was not known until recently, just an uh, experimental result from the point of view of anything else. The second observation which I would like to describe is that if you have n less or equal than 4, there are one loop super amplitude anomalies. You may have heard that there is a huge progress with computation of amplitudes. And in particular, there is a new understanding of anomalies. And it is a great honor to speak about anomalies in presence of Professor Fujikawa here. Because we know, and Professor Atia, of course, we know how fundamental is this issue. You can't avoid it when you have anomalies. However, what we learned very recently that in n greater or equal than 5, there are no one-loop superamplitude anomalies of the kind which are no, known with smaller supersymmetry. So this is very recent. And then an additional part of the story is that 
in these models, there are something uh, which are called hidden symmetries. They're dualities. In n equals 8, the symmetry is called E77. In n equals 6, it is SO star 12. And in n equals 5, it is SU15. And they seem to play an important role in this story. Can you? E. E exceptional. Yeah. But it's not compact. It has seven. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the large brink knows most about it. Yeah. And, but it, it seems to play a very important role. And so what I'll tell you now that some of these spontaneously broken symmetries will be tested in uh, cosmological observations. Um, so now I'm giving a short summary of cosmological part of my talk. First, the BMOD detection, if it will take place, will probe energies at about 10 to the 13 GeV, which is billion times higher than the energies probed at LHC, if we see them. If we don't see them, then of course we don't know what is Hubble. They could be as low as possible, and therefore detection or not detection the next 20 years is crucial. Whereas LIGA discovery of gravitational wave confirms general relativity, a discovery of primordial gravitational waves will confirm our understanding of quantum gravity up to energies of inflation, since we describe inflationary perturbation using both general relativity and quantum field theory, as Slava Mohanov taught us, we already know from CMB fluctuation that there is a quantum element in inflation. But this concerns only scalar perturbation so far, and we don't know for sure where is the energy of inflation. However, if we will detect gravity waves, we will know that our understanding of quantum gravity all the way up to, say, 10 to the 13 is valid because of this combination. How to use quantum mechanics for evaluating the perturbations in the context of general relativity. So the range of B-mod space detectors, when R goes to minus 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3, is particularly interesting since it has targets from fundamental physics, as I mentioned, string theory, M theory, maximal supergravity. And so I'm giving a short summary of our results. There are seven values which scan the range between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2. And in these alpha attractor models, there is a value of observables. R is measured and NS, tilt of the spectra, is measured. And this letter N means the number of e-folding of inflation. So in this class of models, the value of R, first of all, the value of NS for uh, number of e-folding approximately um, 0 0.96 can be taken like 55. And then all we need to understand the value of R is the detection. There is a single parameter which describes it. And so in these fundamental models, if we start with maximal supersymmetry, this parameter 3 alpha takes seven discrete values. And for people who know more of the cosmology, the case of Starobinsky and Hicks uh, Shaposhnikov inflation is the case alpha equals 1. It is 3 alpha equals 3. It is this case. And therefore, it is included. The most interesting, well-known cosmological models are included. But we have now more. OK, let me start. Because I was asked to give a very general talk, I'll entertain you by telling you my impression of most interesting conference of um, previous year. And, the, f and uh, the first one I want to mention was in a, uh, in a beautiful Spicola Vaticana. It was in May 2017. And I'll tell you more about <coughs> And the title was Black Holes, Gravitational Waves, and Space-Time Singularities. Then, of course, there was a Steve Hawking birthday conference uh, also in July. And it was called uh, Gravity and Black Holes. So there is an increasing interest to this topic. And there were two very recent workshops I participated. One had the name B-Mode from Space Workshop, 
which was in Berkeley at the end of December. And my information will come from here. And there was simultaneously Breakthrough Prize Symposium also in December at Stanford. And so the information which I'll bring up on the cosmological side uh, concerns CMBS4. This is the project uh, which also will go for next 20 years, uh, where the CMB experiments will proceed. And finally, there is this light bird satellite mission, um, as of now approved by JAXA, supposed to fly in 2025. <coughs> And the main purpose is to the detection of B-modes. So let me tell you, there are many people from Belgium here, so you may like to hear about it. So it, it was, this, this workshop was dedicated to Lemaitre, who was a priest and a physicist. And so uh, astronomers in Specola Vaticana had a full confirmation of Pope Francis. And we had a beautiful workshop there. And then Pope Francis gave us a um, handshake. And part of his speech, which is relevant after the conference, was the following, that the issues you have been addressing during these days at Castel Gandolfo are of particular interest to church because they have to do with questions that concerns us deeply, such as the beginning of the universe, it's evolution, the profound structure of space and time. And let me quickly show you the handshake. Now, so now I move on to workshops in December, where what we uh, were told, definitely that uh, in US, funding agencies are extremely interested in cosmology and specifically in CMBS4. And so the executive summary report includes the following relevant information. That the goal and requirement for CMBS4 is to measure the imprint of primordial gravitational waves on CMB polarization anisotropy quantified by tensor to scalar ratio R. CMBS4 will be designed to provide the detection of R above 003 in the absence of a signal CMBS4 will be designed to constrain R less than 1 times 10 to the minus 3 at 95% confidence level, nearly two orders of magnitude more stringent than current constraints. This will test many of the simplest models of inflation, including those based on symmetry principles. And I think there was a significant influence from people who insist that it is a symmetry which we want them to test in the sky that occur at high energy and large inflaton field. The R requirements have been translated into measurement requirement consistent with projecting out foregrounds and other contamination. So it is well known that this measurement is extremely difficult. And still, uh, if there is a success, then it is a huge, uh, a huge difference. Uh, this, by the way, I was asked to explain uh, so there was a uh, BMOD from space workshop, and I gave a first talk, and everybody else, or e almost everybody, are in experiment for BMODs. So I talked about inflation, BMOD targets, and fundamental physics, which I'll tell you more. And so um, for people who have heard that LIGO detected gravitational waves from binary black holes or other objects, uh, with a wavelength of thousands of kilometers. But the primordial gravity waves affecting CMB have wavelengths of billions of light years. And this is a major difference. This is why they are called primordial. So this is also a well-known picture, which shows frequency of different waves. And the one which have been detected gave us a beautiful test of general relativity. And they're approximately here. But if the B mode will be detected, as I already mentioned, it will be test of quantum gravity. And to finish the introductory part of my talk, I'll just uh, bring up uh, the talk which was given at Stanford by Lyman Page. Um, and so he says that the future gravitational waves from the birth of the universe 
And he says, in 10 years or maybe more. So the way he characterized the situation is primordial gravitational wave would be a direct connection between gravitation and quantum mechanical processes, a test of cosmology, and the link between Einstein and Bohr that has eluded physics for 100 years. And it was very nice to hear it from experimentalists. So he understands how difficult it is, but uh, so he also mentioned that that talk that they got 40 million grant from Simons and um, the discussion was the generosity of this award is unprecedented and hopefully it will work. So they're geared up to do the measurement and to compete with each other because there are many independent uh, measurements. So let me move to part one which is formal theory, and you will see a little bit later the meaning of this triangle. So with regard to maximal supersymmetry and B modes, trying to avoid technical details, which are in the paper with Sergio Ferrara, I'll just repeat that we deal on equal footing with M theory, superstring theory, or supergravity maximal. And so the most important Think which you want to know because people who know cosmology are asking what is the inflaton? In this context, uh, in maximal supersymmetric case, scalars are coordinate of the coset space, G over H, where G is E77 and SU8 is uh, H, and the difference between those are 70, and there are 70 scalars. So E77 is known to have SL2R seven times. And that is important. This is why I told you there will be seven targets for, uh, for the observation. So geometries with discrete number of unit size Poincare disk, which is SL2R, <coughs> are possible when consistent reduction of supersymmetry is performed. And so the modular space is something many people may have seen and the metric is dt dt bar divided by t plus t bar squared. And when k here takes this seven discrete value, which is three alpha, this corresponds in n equals a supergravity precisely to the fact that E77 has this uh, subgroup, which is a statement that at least one disk and no more than seven in this class of theory. So they are falsifiable by the data. Let's see in which way. So for example, if we take 55 E foldings, then it is easy to check that R will take value approximately from 10 to the minus 3 all the way to 10 to the minus 2. So what is maximum supergravity? Many of you may have seen this picture. It flips. So there is a graviton with helicity plus 1. <coughs> And there are all other particles, and we end up with graviton with helicity plus two. And the theory is also associated with Young triangle. And this is n equals four Young Mills here. And the corresponding Pascal triangle also explains the situation with number of states in this series. So what is new and what is relevant? So at about 2007, there was the first computation of the third loop in n equals eight, which observed that nine diagrams each has UV divergence, but they cancel. Then in 2009, two years later, there was an analogous observation, but there were 82 diagrams, and they also cancel, and they so the, the, let's call it experiment, computational experiment. On the other hand, theory was uh, able to explain this cancellation using this E77 symmetry. Now in 2014, the next experiment was made in N equals five, loop number four. There were another 82 diagrams. They canceled and there is no explanation and this is this unfinished paper which I referred to, and we hope that it will work. And either way, the fact that at least in some cases, it is this symmetry which protects 
um, from UV infinities will be of important nature in cosmology. And just to tell you what the symmetry is, why it is called hidden, it is tricky, and it involves the presence of the um, Maxwell field as well as the dual field strengths, which is a derivative of Lagrangian over this Maxwell field. And then there is a symplectic doublet, which transforms, as you see here. And it was, uh, it didn't, is not described well by Netter theory. You actually need netter gayar zumina current conservation. And instead of the action, instead of being invariant, has to transform. And therefore, those symmetries are kind of mysterious. And however, what we see, on one hand, they protect from UV infinities. On the other hand, they play a role in cosmology. In particular, those symmetries, they flip a Bianchi identity into field equation for the vector. And so in the computation n equals phi is of huge importance because if it represents any of them, eight or five, then it is good to use the formalism which was suggested by Ferrara et al. in the context of black hole attractors and their universality. And this is just a table which tells you that you can use uh, any of these coset spaces. The scalars are there. And everything can be described using a generic M. And you end up with analysis which says, whatever E77 does for n equals 8, SO star 12 for n equals 6, and SU15 for n equals 5. Because here are the computations which just happened recently were not explained. It appears, and this is our group preliminary result, that these duality symmetries protect n greater than four supergravities from UV divergences in all known cases. And it is important that it works only in case of no anomalies. As you know, standard model <laughs> happen to have no anomalies. And then you start trusting symmetries. So something analogous appears to happen here. And so I finished with the formal part. And now let me tell you uh, about cosmology. So how many of you have seen this map? Many. OK. So you know they measured all over the sky, and they uh, analyzed all the correlators. There is a huge amount of information, which boils down to something which arguably looks like cosmological concordance model described by just few parameters. And so let me just mention that we certainly have detected CMB polarization with uh, features. And we are also looking for gravitational waves, which should come from the early times. And if you look at this picture, you will see that primordial gravitational waves called B modes, they were created during inflation. So they will come from 13.8 billion years and they have not been detected. Whereas gravitational wave already detected by LIGO from binary black hole mergers, they came from about 1.3 billion years ago, from somewhere here. And it took 100 years after Einstein prediction. So we can wait for 20 years for B modes or more, who knows. And so this is what is known as standard cosmological model which requires, of course, uh, approximately 70% of dark energy, which is often associated with cosmological constant. And it requires still a discovery of dark matter, and we don't know what dark matter is. And this 4% is all we know about the universe. But it seems to be consistent when you analyze all the dots on this huge map of the sky. And the reason why people tend to believe into this is this incredible agreement which was achieved. This is Planck 2015, but also this tail uh, was using the data from many other telescopes more recently. So 
Uh, this is the Planck 2015 result. And this is the value of uh, two fundamental parameters which they measure. One is tilt of the spectrum, and the other is um, this parameter r. And so we know that r has to be below here. And the models which I want to describe a little bit, <coughs> they are called alpha attractors. They were discovered by uh, Linda Ross and myself in 2013. And you see them in these two yellow stripes. The, the difference between them is the choice of number of a folding. But they are nicely going inside what is called sweet spot of the data, this dark blue region. So if B modes will be discovered soon, and I just heard from Slava Muhanov that he heard rumors. <laughs> A joke, okay. So if they will be discovered before 10 to the minus two, it means we will have many uh, candidates like natural inflation, axion monodromy, alpha attractors, this part, and they will all be validated and there will be a competition which model actually describe the first 10 to the minus 35 seconds. But, uh, in case they will not de be discovered, we really have to switch to logarithmic scale in R to see more clearly what is going on between 10 to the minus two and 10 to the minus three. What do we know? And so in short, if we open CMB S4, this is a big um, collaboration now in US where Practically all CMB physics is going on. On the South Pole, in Chile, uh, in Tibet, and in, an, uh, in um, Greenland. Those are also dry air, and they can use the new detectors there. So in their CMB S4 book, we see the following. This is the, their picture with prediction of what will happen in future. So those are sweet spots. and. The statement is when CMBS4 will do everything they can, they're likely to come here close to 10 to the minus two. And the model which they describe here include R squared Starobinsky model, which is sitting here, include Higgs model, which is sitting here. The difference between those two is due to the most natural choice of number of folding for these two models. And then they show this gray stripe, which are our models, alpha attractor models. And so when we looked at this, it was like, so we are going to, to send all the satellite just to have those two targets. Is it not, um, can we find more? That was the purpose. And so this is in short, what happens with our models when alpha decreasing, we go down. But uh, in all cases, close to the desired value of NS. So for those of you who don't know what is Poincare disk, you go to Wolfram and you will see this picture and you will see this geometry. And so if you have a unit size Poincare disk, happened to correspond to alpha equals one third. Let me remind you that Higgs and, uh, and Starobinsky are alpha equals one. And this is R 10 to the minus three, the lowest target for B modes. So the recent set of cosmological observations seem to indicate that uh, the plateau potentials work well. And so if we go from this hyperbolic geometry, we end up, so this is, you see dz dz bar divided by one minus dz bar squared is what you know as a hyperbolic Poincare disk. And then you choose some simple potential and this is what you find and those are T models. The potential is times squared and this is our, um, half plane models and those given particular Starobinsky model. So this is what I told you, we have to switch to 
logarithmic scale in R. So here is NS. The reason these models are called attractors because at very large alpha, they could be phi squared or phi six or whatever, but then they tend to go to a single place and they are, be they are becoming universal. <coughs> and eventually, uh, the value, uh, which is a maximal target, 10 to the minus three, is in fact accidentally associated with either maximal supergravity or with maximal superconformal theory. Or you can use uh, different, the E models, they're slightly different. And for those of you who have seen uh, Starobinsky model, this is a case N equals one, and alpha equals one. This is a well-known situation. So those alpha attractors involve Higgs and Starobinsky, well-known in cosmological community, but they have more. So uh, you may have heard that the measurements of the curvature of the three-dimensional space was a holy grail of cosmology because it was known that once we learn uh, whether it is uh, open or closed or um, flat universe, we will know the future of the universe. This is not valid anymore because there is a dark energy. And so the earlier desire just to learn the geometry and the, to know the curvature of the three-dimensional space-time remained true. And for example, uh, from everything we know, it looks like the universe is flat. The choice here of this geometry corresponds to a flat case. However, the future large-scale structure surveys, one of the goal is to check it with better precision. And so we don't know for sure. It's still few digits we want to, to know. Now, with this parameter alpha and alpha attractors <coughs> has a simple meaning. It is the curvature of the modular space. And therefore, if those models, uh, so those are observables, and this alpha is um, associated with the cur killer curvature of the, of the manifold. And the curvature is inverse to alpha. Everything is rather simple here. And so when uh, Lyman Page, who is one of the main um, people in the experiment, asked me, I don't know what is Keller geometry. Can you please explain it to me in an easier way? So for the next year meeting, I had the following explanation for him, that if you know what is Poincare disk, and you have seen Escher's pictures, three alpha is the radius square of the hyperbolic disk, and he, uh, uh, he told me he likes it better. And so if they measure in the context of, this of these models, three alpha, this geometric parameter, is actually 10 to the three times the measured value of R. Okay, this is just to tell you that there is a cosmological model and I don't want to bother you. So you, you write down the Keller potential, the super potential, you run Mathematica, Everything works beautiful, and you end up with these seven values. So <clears throat> um, in Slavas Mohanov's work, I don't know if he will talk about this or not, he had this idea that the observed value of a tilt of the spectra is well described by something like that, where this could be a number here of the order one. And he had hydrodynamical consideration. What we observed, that if we would go for backwards, assume we didn't invent this model, but somebody would tell us this is NS. How can you uh, describe it? And we would tell, looking back, it is a Poincare disk which just supplies this formula with a factor of two, which is a good description of data. So we go from the sky and we ask, what have we learned about fundamental physics? We have learned that the geometric model with, uh, where the inflaton is part of the modular space geometry seem to work well. So in attempt to describe our results, I'm saying that using a consistent reduction from maximal supersymmetry, M theory, 
string theory, maximum supergravity to minimal n equals one supersymmetry. We have deduced the favorite models with hyperbolic geometry. And to make the story simple, three alpha is the radial square of the Escher disk, and it goes from seven to one. And they're all favorite. And so they scan this interesting region. However, if it would be just n equals one, if we would not go from maximal supersymmetry, three alpha is arbitrary. And so this parameter is totally arbitrary in general, but in the context of these models, it is measurable. And so it is very interesting to learn what the data will tell us. <coughs> okay, so now I, I bring back <coughs> why I was asked to explain to people what are the targets in these models. So I go back to this CMBS4 um, book where there are, there are plans for next 20 years where there was just uh, two models, Hicks and Starobinsky. And we have seven uh, targets here and they include the one which were known before. And then a few words about CORE. Uh, some of you may know that this European project CORE, uh, Cosmic Origin Explorer, as for now, is not to be funded. However, there was a lot of theoretical studies which they made. In particular, they promised a significant improvement of the value of the tilt of the spectrum. And this didn't happen, but you see here again, this is the main region of interest, and our new models are here. And they are simple, in a sense, start with maximal supersymmetry, uh, break it spontaneously to n equals one, and get the cosmological models, and wait for the date. Yeah, uh, we spent last summer in Leiden. I was nominated to be a Lawrence professor, and accidentally, there is a group working on Euclid there. Euclid is the funded in Europe satellite with the purpose of getting large-scale structure cosmological survey data. And they all kind of tried to prove that cosmological constant is not dark energy. At least this is their um, goal, to see deviation. Uh, so the equation of state, if it is cosmological constant, if 70% of dark of everything we see is just a cosmological constant, it would mean the equation of state W equals minus one. By the way, how many minutes I have? Oh, very good, thanks. So W is the ratio of uh, pressure to um, energy, and pure cosmological constant is in perfect agreement with data as of today. However, the excuse of sending this $1 billion satellite, Euclid, is to prove that W is not e equals to minus one, and that the cosmological constant is not a good description of the data, which could mean that either W is a different constant, slightly deviating from minus one, or it is a function of the redshift, it's not a constant. So this is what Euclid will be doing. And because we were in the same uh, building, they had one after the other seminars on modified gravity. Despite the current discovery of gravitational waves, which supports general relativity so nicely. But so then we decided, can we use alpha attractors in a way so that we do not end the inflation at the minimum of the potential where we naturally get cosmological constant, especially in the context of superstring landscape. Um, there are many options for cosmological constant, in particular the one we observe. And we decided to build models which uh, allow us a deviation of W from minus one. And we learned that this is extremely hard to do because in most cases W still wants to be minus one. And so this was published very recently. Oops, typo here, sorry. 
So we created something which we called a two-shoulder alpha attractor model. So there is one plateau where there is inflation at Hubble parameter very high, and there is another one here. And most of the models simply tell us W equals minus one. But there was one particular model which was kind of funny. <coughs> as many people told me, what a cute model. So it has the following prediction. I already showed you this formula many times. So the alpha is related to the level of primordial gravitational waves. But in this model, also the asymptotic value of W, which is the main equation of state, deviate from minus one due to the inverse dependence of the same parameter. And this is interesting. This is, by the way, the comparison of, uh, uh, of our model with available data and with future data. And so what is interesting, if we take the case where three alpha equals seven, which correspond to r to the min uh, mi 10 to the minus two, the earliest possible discovery in this field, then the prediction of this funny model is the w at infinity is indeed minus 0 0.9. We truly believe that this model will be ruled out. Well, nevertheless, after we studied it, it's there. So what it tells you that Lightbird, this satellite mission approved in Japan for now, um, uh, may discover this here, or maybe somebody else, whereas Euclid main purpose is to go for deviation from W equals minus one from cosmological constant. So there is one extremely simple, very geometric model, which has those two shoulders, which is subject to be ruled out by two totally independent experiments. So this is my last slide. I think I have enough time. So let me show again uh, the following. Oops. Yeah, so the same picture of uh, current and future data, which shows you the plane R versus NS. And so our new um, finding suggests the following, that if we have something which is called for many years quintessential infl inflation, allows to increase the number of E foldings N, which slightly increases NS for alpha attractor models, it moves it to this direction. With better precision on spectral index, we may differentiate in the future between inflation ending at the minimum of the potential, which are those models I showed you, which we studied for many years. We wanted cosmological constant. But now that we have the other models, um, if we take a model which end instead of the minimum at a second plateau, then even equation of state is W minus one, as in majority of this model. There will be a nice move of, for example, this point towards the uh, larger value of NS if the future data will require it. And so this is very nice and because it was extremely difficult to do it otherwise. It turns out we just need a sudden inflation quintessential inflation. And so personally, I'm looking forward to new data because hopefully they will rule out the model which we don't like, but we have to agree they exist. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, first, uh, um, you know, I, I've been, you know, arguing that, that if you really look at the, the, the full action, it's e even more invariant than E7. It's, you can even find E8, you know. So that should affect the, the, the dynamics. We, we can discuss that privately. Yeah, I, I know this, and as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, there is nobody but who knows E7 in the context of supergravity better than Lars. And this might be the case 
And so what we are doing with this group of people I mentioned, Herman Nicolay, who is one of the best in supergravity, uh, Radu Royban in Amplitudes, and the younger postdoc with us, we are looking for all those issues because we have the data, the computational data, when 82 diagrams collapse, you really want an explanation. Mm -hmm. Maybe this will come up, mm -hmm. we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I wanted to ask about is that, so if you go to this energy, it's 10 to the 13 or so, where you're, you're going to probe, yes. then you, you're you looking at an N equals 1 supergravity theory. Yes. So you know what? Why because, should it be N equals 1? Because that? I need a potential. Mm. See, I need it to be very flat. And what is interesting for formal people, the symmetry, the part of E77, seven seven which protects known model from UV infinities is the part which keeps the potential flat. And there is some mystery in it. But, but I need the potential because the normal E77 is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And in particular, it is broken down to a product of seven disks. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a potential because this is already N equals one. But then you mean that if you start from the beginning, you're, you're spontaneously breaking it down, the, the, the original theory, to an N equals one theory. Yeah. <laughs> but there should also be memories of that, that it yes. is a spontaneous symmetry yes, break. Yes, the you? memory is in the kinetic term. Mm -hmm. And the kinetic term is precisely dz, dz bar divided by one minus dz bar squared. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is universality. Everything depends only on the structure of kinetic terms in this model because this parameter is a uh, uh, curvature. Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, if I may, a, a couple of comments and a question. Sure. So the first comment is that uh, what you call alpha attractors, we discovered earlier, I think, that in the context of no-scale supergravity. That is correct. So in particular, the cases of uh, alpha equals one, two, and three, we discussed in one of our papers earlier in 2013. Yeah. So I think what this means is that uh, if the data do point in that direction, this doesn't necessarily imply that you have to go the direction That's of true. maximal uh, maximal supersymmetry. Yes. That's true, it's the general. But I would say, in the context of my class of model, the falsification through the data is what was explained. Yeah. But of course, um, Higgs is the general with Starobinsky, or. Um, natural inflation with action monodromy. So once they give us the data, there will be a huge competition about which of them is actually relevant. And yes, there is a degeneracy. I totally agree. Yeah, so I think people should be aware of that. Yeah. The second comment that I want to make is that I think a precise measurement of NS is very interesting because that is related, as you said, to the number of E-folds. The number of E-folds is sensitive to the way in which the inflaton decays. And so that's potentially a direct window on the connection between inflationary cosmology and the standard model. More than that, what I'm, that with understanding of this, see what uh, people who made this picture, they have placed Starobinsky to the left from hit, <coughs> precisely by evaluation of this fact, how it hit, hitting proceeds. But I'm saying more than that, if you agree, to uh, not to have a standard reheating at the minimum, but to have a second shoulder, then you can move any model from here towards this direction. And this was not known. It was known that it is extremely difficult to avoid all the constraints of reheating when they are associated with the minimum of the potential. So it is very recent observation due to kination. It prolongs the number of folding in addition to all known things about the heat. Yeah, so I think it just goes in the direction of saying that uh, future uh, CMB experiments should not just focus on R, but also uh, on it. Yeah, yeah. so, so finally, my question. Uh, so, so what are the prospects for proving this uh, finiteness of maximal supergravity models you know, beyond the loop level which you've already achieved? OK, as of now, three famous um, experiments, n equals 3 and 4 in n equals 8. Uh, they are explained by E77, by the way, by soap behavior. Is Malcolm here? Malcolm here. Yeah. So 
uh, E77, because this symmetry is spontaneously broken, instead of 133 scalars, we have 70. There is an adverb zero, there is a soft behavior. So what people, the way they explain the cancellation of nine or 82 diagram was precisely observing that the single soft scalar limit is not vanishing. So it breaks E77, precisely the part associated with soft behavior. In N equals five, for last three years, the result is known, no explanation. And we seem to come close to explanation, but it's not finished. The work is not finished. <coughs> I have a simple question. I don't think I remember the definition of E folding N. What is N? What oh, is, now give now me a simple definition. Either, so how much the universe expands, uh, well, it is, I think, no, but is it, of sorry, I, I, so, sorry, no, I don't want a physical explanation. I want a mathematical explanation. E to the n. So uh, inflation is exponential, is an explosion. So the universe from a tiny size okay. becomes huge. The number of it folding. Well, why is it an integer? Oh, it is not. It's, it's not. approximate. I see, okay. Yeah, it's approximate. And we actually don't know it, except as John explained, with reheating procedure, end of inflation tells us what N is. Why do you call it E-folding? Terminology is very suggestive. E to the N. This is how much the universe expands. Expand. E, e stands for expansion. It is a huge number. E, e means expansion. Exponent. 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 Power N. And folding, folding means? It just means the equivalent exponential factor by an amount e to the n. And it, yeah. Yes, but that's algebraic. Uh, sorry, I, is, this word says a lot of geometry to me, and you're giving me algebraic answers. Okay. Maybe I'll try to explain yeah, no, no, it better, no. but thanks yeah. for asking. Okay, I guess it's coffee time now. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Okay.